Yeah, I'm good to go. Is this microphone on? Um, Hello? Hello? Uh, it is yeah. perfect. Shall I go into my face? Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today in our second event for World Space Week for AstroSoc, and I think one of the first ever collabs between PPS and AstroSoc and SATAB as well. Um, so today, <laughs> <laughs> we can all clap. <laughs> First things first, just as a disclaimer, this, uh, this talk is being recorded, but no one in the audience is captured in the recording. It's just the speaker and the front and the slides, so you're good. And yeah, with no further ado, I'll just introduce ourselves and I'll introduce our speaker and we'll get started. Um, I'm Anwesha, I'm the outreach officer for AstroSoc. If you have messaged AstroSoc on Instagram, you've probably chatted with me. <laughs> yes, I'm Tom, I'm the president of PPS, if you don't know. Yeah, I just also want to say quickly that at the end of the talk, we'll be having wine, this time wine, not just juice, in the same room. So if you want to stick around, ask the speaker any questions, mm -hmm. we'll be here for a little bit, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm Oscar, I'm the chair of AstroSoc. Um, I've sort of been not doing a lot this evening, which is quite nice, but I'll be around the <laughs> wine later, so I've got the best of both ends. And I'm Raoul, and I'm the secretary, and I'm in charge of keeping all the technology running smoothly, so <laughs> let's see how that goes. So if anything breaks, it's his fault. <laughs> So joining us this evening is Dr. Alec Roberts, who is a research fellow at the University of Manchester. And he's going to be talking about construction materials for outer space. If you've kept up with our social media and email promotions, you do know what the bio and the abstract is about. So without taking any more time, I'll pass it on to Alec. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, so yeah, my name's Alad Roberts, uh, just a bit of a background first, I suppose. So I did a degree in chemistry at the University of Liverpool, and then I did a PhD jointly at the University of Liverpool and in Singapore, uh, and that was kind of like pivoted more towards like material science, materials engineering, uh, and I did some electrochemistry as well, but I hated electrochemistry, so I dropped that, and then I did some postdocs, where I, that's when I came to Manchester, and that's when I started working at the interface of materials science and um, biotechnology. And I've kind of remained in that area, uh, specialising into what I'm going to uh, talk about today. So since it's um, Space and Sustainability Week, uh, the first part of my presentation, I'm just going to be talking about um, mainly green um, aspects of, of, of space science. Uh, so at first, si at first sight, it might seem like a bit of an oxymoron, uh, space and sustainability, um, you know, when most people think of space, the last thing they think of is um, green technologies. So you might think of um, the Saturn V rocket, uh, not exactly green, uh, burning. I think it's like a, an Olympic-sized uh, swimming pool of, um, of refined kerosene per second. Huge cost as well, 280 billion uh, for the Apollo program. Uh, or you might think of um, you know the eccentric billionaires Elon Musk firing his car into space, or Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson with their um, ambitions to kind of turn space into like a, a tourist uh, zone. So it's not exactly a green form of um, tourism. Uh, and then yeah, the, well the International Space Station, um, very great for science, but it's had a huge cost. Um, so 160 billion pounds, I think it was the most uh, expensive human construction ever made. So it does beg the question, you know, why are we putting all this money into space when we could spend it on green technologies? However, uh, space does have quite a strong legacy um, in green technology. So let me explain. So basically, for example, the, the Apollo program or the Apollo Gemini programs and really and beyond, they spearheaded many... Um, green technologies really, so solar voltaic cells were really kind of um, pushed forward because they needed a way to power like the lunar, the lunar lander and if you just get the energy from the sun then that, that's fantastic, it means you don't have to take batteries or whatever. Uh, hydrogen fuel cells were, were really pushed forward uh, by the Gemini and Apollo programs as well uh, because uh, they were going to have hydrogen oxygen anyway and if you can turn that into electricity to power uh, the command module and then have the byproduct be water, which the astronauts can then drink, then it, it ticks loads of boxes, so it really pushed that technology forward. Advanced insulation materials were, were also uh, really pushed forward by, by space exploration, because uh, you know the part of the, the, the spaceship that's in the sun gets really hot, and then the other part gets very cold, so you really need to have 
uh, really good insulation against those um, extreme temperature swings. And um, so those, those are just three green technologies, but then there's also other kind of like, ooh, there's also other like hidden green technologies as well. Uh, so for example, satellite technologies obviously uh, were, were, were developed because we, we kind of pushed um, the, back, the frontiers of, of space exploration. And um, these days, you know, obviously satellites are really important for day-to-day for, for -day lives, but also they're, they're very important for emissions monitoring. So for example, you can monitor um, emissions of um, greenhouse gases like methane, uh, hot spots on maps, uh, aerosols and, and ozone. Um, so that's a really important green uh, aspect of, of, of space technology and also monitoring of, of agriculture and forestry. So this accounts for like 24% of global greenhouse gases um, and it would be very difficult to monitor like deforestation if you had to, you know, kind of physically monitor it from the ground. But obviously with satellites, you can quite easily see where it's being deforested. Um, so that's a, that's a very important technology that's come from, uh, green technology that's come from space exploration. And of course, there's all sorts of advanced technologies that have really been driven forward by space exploration. Uh, so for example, uh, integrated circuits like microchips, basically. Uh, the Apollo program uh, bought like, I think over half the world's supply of, of integrated circuits over the 60s, back when they were extremely expensive. So it really helped like support that early industry and help get microchips off the ground uh, so that's why we have these, um, you know, really cheap microchips these days, uh, thanks to uh, largely uh, space exploration pursuit. Um, but the question really is, what about the future? So, so those are things from like, you know, the past space exploration. So a big question is, you know, could, could future technologies uh, developed for space have, have some kind of green legacy as well? And, oop, and if so, what would that be? And just to put things into context, when some, some people think of um, the future, you know, they're thinking far into the future, you know, these kind of like um, mega kind of structures uh, for supporting hu human life, you know, thousands of years into the future. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the relatively near-term future. Actually, you know, climate change and stuff, it's something we have to deal with now uh, within the next, you know, 50 year or so years, really. So can these technologies that we're going to you know, use for the next kind of generation of um, space pursuit have a, have a green legacy? Um, so that's one, what I'm generally going to be talking about today. Uh, so just to make sure we're on the same page, because uh, I guess we all have like different uh, backgrounds here, I'm just going to talk about the architecture of upcoming space missions, so how we're going to do it. Um, and I'm largely basing this on NASA's uh, design reference architecture, architecture number five, which was published in 2009. It's a really comprehensive document. It's a bit out of date now, but it's still so comprehensive, and I think it's the most realistic kind of plan we have for uh, getting back to the moon um, and going on to Mars. And yet yeah, a lot of these plans have actually come to fruition, so their kind of future plans seem quite feasible as well. Uh, so first of all, we're, we're going back to the moon, um, if the space launch system ever takes off. Um, and the plan is essentially to use the moon, uh, the next kind of um, yeah, foray to the moon as like a gateway, as, like a, as a springboard to then go on to Mars. So the things we do on the moon, the technologies we develop for, for lunar habitation, these next kind of like... Um, yeah, for into space, it's largely going to be built around further uh, the next step, which is getting to Mars. So we want to develop and test technologies, uh, stay for roughly the same amount of time on the moon that we'd have to stay on Mars, uh, and, and reduce the cost of going to Mars and reduce the, the overall risk. Because when we go to Mars, um, we have to stay. If, if, you're on, if you're on the International Space Station, it's an emergency. You can, you can get back to Earth within, within minutes, really. Um, if you're on the moon, it will take like a few days if there's an emergency. You can, you know, get into like a uh, an escape vehicle and get back to Earth. But on Mars, just because of uh, the orbits of of, of, the, of of the Earth and Mars have to be in in specific alignment, uh, so so launch windows. You have once you're on Mars, if there's disaster, you might be stuck there for hundreds of days before you have any chance of getting back or having any chance of like rescue from Earth. So that's a big challenge. Um, the lack of kind of um, an escape route if something goes wrong. Uh, Mars missions will also probably have a crew of about six, according to NASA. Uh, this is just because they've decided that six has got a, a good balance of, of different skill sets that will be needed. 
And um, obviously, if you're just sending like one or two people, the, the whole mission will be very expensive for those two people. And if you add like an extra person, it increases the overall mission cost, but the cost per person gets reduced because they're all sharing resources and stuff. And you either decided about six is probably the sweet spot in terms of like number of people. And we'll probably go to Mars um, over three missions over 10 years. Again, this is largely due to um, orbital windows like the moon and uh, so the earth and mars have to be in a certain alignment before you can launch rockets and then you have to wait um a long time before the next kind of ideal period to go is so it'll probably be three missions over 10 years according to nasa and another thing to to point out is we'll very likely be visiting different locations because the first trips to, to mars won't probably won't be for colonization unless Elon Musk has something to do with it. It will be for science, and we want to visit areas of specific scientific interest. And this is important because it basically means we're not going to be going to locations which are like specifically or the most ideal to set up a habitat, and we'll be not, and we can't just set up one uh, Mars base and then we'll, we'll be sending the, the same crews back to the same place. So we'll need to build fresh habitats wherever we go on Mars. And the technologies we develop, uh, for example, for construction, which I'll talk about a bit later, they have to be... Um, broad, they can't just be, you know, you can't just use a specific type of mineral to build your habitat because that will constrain your location to a specific a specific area. Same goes for like lava tubes, like lava tubes um, are proposed to be quite an ideal place to set up a Martian colony, but if then you're constrained to that, those areas with lava tubes or the north and south poles where you, you'll have um, abundant water ice would be great, but then you're stuck in the north and south pole and you can't explore the rest of Mars if your technology is dependent on, on that. Um, and the other thing is that mission cost and risk will need to be minimised. So, yeah, it's still not guaranteed we'll go to Mars in the next, um, yeah, by 2030s, I think is the, is the current estimate. But it will depend on cost. If the cost is too high, um, it, will, the, the, it just won't be feasible. Um, it's, it would be great if we can go, but, you know, when, when it gets to the public kind of debate and it's, it's, you know, they're comparing the number of schools, the number of hospitals you can build, instead of going to Mars, the overall cost is going to basically dictate if we actually go or not. Um, and risk is inversely proportional to cost, so obviously we want to minimise the risk to the crew as much as possible. But the more we reduce the risk, the more that pushes up costs. So, you know, if we have to have lots of backup systems, <coughs> loads of redundancy, uh, you know, mission critical systems are, assist, are basically something that if it breaks down, it could lead to the loss of the crew. So we need to have backup systems and redundancies for them. Um, and if they're not very reliable, um, or if we want to reduce that risk as much as possible, it's going to push up the cost because we're going to need, you know, extra, extra piece of equipment, extra launch mass. Um, and yes, yeah, so the cost is, is also proportional to the initial mass to low Earth orbit. So basically the amount of mass you have to get off Earth into orbit is a big factor in the cost. Once you're in orbit, it doesn't take a huge amount of, of energy to then, to then maneuver from orbit. But if you have um, very expensive, if you're very heavy kind of systems, if your whole kind of like um, architecture for getting to Mars is, is very heavy, then that's going to push the cost up and that's going to reduce the feasibility. So that's something that, um, is, that needs to be considered. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is the notion of hyper-resourcefulness, circularity and sustainability in space. So to minimise these mission costs, as I've just talked about, we're going to need to be extremely resourceful. So almost everything is going to have to be recycled. Already on the Inter International Space Station, they try to minimise waste. They recycle. This is a urine reprocessing machine. So all your urine basically has to go into a machine, and they, you, you re-drink that water. And yeah, even like your breath, you can't just let that kind of escape out into space. Obviously, the, the moisture in your breath is collected and recycled, and you drink that again. So we already do that at the International Space Station, but we need to take that to the next level to get to Mars and and uh, increase the feasibility. Uh, equipment will need to be ultra reliable and easily repairable because obviously, uh, as, as I mentioned, minimising risk, any mission critical technologies will have to be super reliable. So if it break, if your water processing machine breaks down and, and everyone does, it's not going to be good. So you not only, only need redundancy, but you need to have very reliable equipment that's very easily repairable. Uh, you need extreme process efficiency. So basically very low energy processes, very low waste uh, processes. Uh, so, for example, you can purify water by distilling it, so boiling it and condensing it, that uses loads of energy. Uh, so we need to develop um, technologies for yeah, purifying water, which uh, use very little energy. Um, we'll need to minimise 
Um, what we use will have very minimal space, but we'll also need to maximise the space. So it's kind of an interesting contrast there. So basically, we can only take the bare minimum amount of stuff because anything actually you take as the launch mass, as the cost, as the complexity. But also, you want to cram it into as small a space as possible, um, because yeah, you can't really afford to have very large living habitat volumes. Um, you need to be yeah really maximise any space you have. So it's kind of like living in like a a student flat again, student hall, where like the space is tiny, but it's always kind of like crowded and cluttered, even though you don't have that much stuff. So we'll have to take that to the, the next level. And systems will need to be highly integrated. Uh, so what I mean by that is basically you're not going to have like a bed and a sofa. You'd have a sofa bed, so that's like an integrated bed sofa system. Swiss Army knife. You know, you could have all the separate tools, but it's if you integrate them all into one handy small tool, same as a spork, a spoon and fork integrated, um, then that, you know, reduces the, the number of systems you have to take, reduces the launch mass, um, increases the feasibility by reducing launch mass. Um, so, yeah, one of the best examples I can think of of that is hydrogen fuel cells, as I mentioned before. So that integrates energy generation uh, with uh, rocket propellant you're going to have anyway. You can have hydrogen oxygen anyway. Um, you want to make energy anyway, and you need to feed astronauts to drink water anyway. So hydrogen fuel cells kind of integrate those three concepts into one. So you just need hydrogen oxygen to have anyway, a hydrogen fuel cell, and then you also have water and you have electricity. Otherwise, you'd have to bring separate water, separate batteries, and also have the hydrogen oxygen anyway. So we really need to integrate things as much as possible um, and have system com commonality. So something breaks down you can have some spare parts which will be used for everything uh, we learned that lesson from the Apollo 13 disaster where um, yeah, one of the carbon dioxide scrubbers broke and they did have another carbon dioxide scrubber but it's on the lunar lander module but because a different company built it they weren't compatible so that almost caused the loss of life of the crew so going forward everything has to be very you know you can't have like different spanners because there's different kind of like uh, types of nuts and bolts it all has to be uh, highly, uh, com uh, a lot of commonality there. And we'll of course have to extensively use uh, in situ resource utilisation, which is essentially living off the land. So anything we can get on the moon and the Mars uh, and then that we can use, we have to make the most of that. Um, yeah, again, just to like reduce launch mass, you don't want to take water if you can get water on Mars or get water on the moon because it would be. You know, it would be silly to, to do so. It would add a lot of costs and complexity. And also hyperlocality. So um, a lot of notions um, for in situ resource utilisation on the moon and Mars, especially on Mars. Uh, they kind of just assume you can get certain minerals from one part of Mars and something else, some other substance, or you can just travel to the water-rich deposit somewhere else. That's going to be very difficult. Um, so you need to be very local in your utilization of resources and um, people won't the human astronauts won't, can't afford to do eva so kind of excursions into the environment just to kind of travel miles away just to mine some minerals and bring them back so you need to be very um local with the resources you use <clears throat> but the key thing is these notions um, could all promote sustainable <laughs> development on earth so just to take the yeah the water example um, for instance, so yeah, if we could develop technologies which were really good at um, purifying water in a very um, energy efficient way, then that's going to be be great for for water security. And yeah, if we can, yeah, if we can do it, yeah, energy low energy way, that's going to save um, energy for sure. And um, if we can design kind of like um, architectures that minimise space, they're very minimal but maximise space, but don't kind of make you go crazy. Um, because it's just kind of too awful, then that would also be good. Um, and if we could integrate systems um, and develop technologies where things are highly integrated, again, you know, it can have benefits on Earth as well. But the thing I'm going to focus on in this talk um, is this in situ resourcealization generally. So now to talk about the actual architecture of, of off-world hab uh, habitats, um, so the, the architecture of, of building um, things really. So the key thing to note here is any kind of like sustained presence on the Moon and Mars, and by definition we'll have to have a sustained presence on Mars just because we have to stay there for, for hundreds of days, and 
moon, the moon is going to be a practice, so we will be staying there for hundreds of days anyway. We have to have very thick walls and ceilings. So this is mainly for radiation protection. So basically, space is really hostile for, for life. And one of the big dangers is, is persistent radiation from the sun and from the galaxy. Uh, in fact, one kind of um, solar particle event, so solar flare, um, essentially, um, if, you're, if the astronaut's unprotected, it can kill them all, just acute radiation sickness. Uh, on Earth, we're protected by the um, global magnetic field um, that deflects all this harmful radiation, so we're not exposed to it. But on the Moon and Mars, they don't have a geomagnetic field, so the astronauts will be exposed to this if they don't have very substantial protection. Um, and it will need to be about a metre thick. It depends on like the radiation tolerance and, and how long the astronauts are going to be exposed for. But generally, it's going to, it's going to have to be quite thick. Um, yeah, if it's like 30 centimetres thick, apparently that's like the worst because you get those like secondary radiation or something. And the physicists probably know more about that than me. But yeah, so about a metre thick. And again, it's, it's definitely not going to be feasible to transport like bulk construction materials like concrete from Earth because that's it's going to be way too heavy. It's going to add way too much to the cost. Um, so we're going to need to utilise in situ resource utilisation uh, to produce these construction materials. And another important thing to note is we need to maximise the unprocessed regolith. So you could ship like a binder from Earth, like a, like a glue essentially, or like a, a plastic resin or something, um, a small amount of that, and then combine it with the moon dust and the Mars dust. That's definitely uh, a feasible option, but you really want to maximise the amount of this, this raw and processed regolith that you use. Uh, you don't want to be taking a lot of stuff from Earth, um, for sure. Uh, and the energy use needs to be minimised as well. Uh, so some notions, as I'll talk about in a bit, they basically use huge amounts of energy, and it's not very feasible because you're going to need to have lots of energy generation equipment, lots of solar panels, and that's going to add launch mass and, and cost, so it, it reduces the feasibility. So I'll just talk through some of the proposed um, technology options to produce yeah, uh, construction materials off-world. So um, the first option um, is basically firing or melting regolith. Essentially, if you got moon dust or Mars dust and heated it to high enough temperature, you can basically turn it back into a lava and then cast it into bricks. Uh, you don't actually have to take it all the way to lava temperatures. If you take it to almost its melting point, it it sinters, so that's how you make ceramics. You basically, you nearly melt it, and then the, the surfaces of the particles uh, melt first and it fuses them together. But, uh, so the advantage of, of, of this type of material is very strong, uh, over 100 mega, megapascals, which is, yeah, stronger than ooh, concrete. Um, <clears throat> you don't need any other ingredients, so you just take the regolith, you just need energy, and you can make this material, and you can make a lot of it, because all you need yeah, is regolith. Uh, but the big disadvantage is it uses huge amounts of energy, and yeah, you can't really plug, um, you, there's no kind of uh, infrastructure for any generation, there's no plugs on Mars, so you're going to have to take more solar panels or more nuclear reactors um, if you wanted to do this method, which will add to cost and complexity. Another option <clears throat> is kind of the opposite, so it's like freezing. So some have suggested you can use water ice to bind regolith. So if you get regolith, add water, freeze it. You can essentially make like a, a brick uh, and make like a Martian-like igloo. Uh, the advantage of this is no other ingredients needed. You just need water. You just need regolith, and you can get water from, from the surface of Mars. Um, the disadvantage, though, it's not super strong, and you need to use a lot of water. And actually extracting water from regolith will use a lot of energy. And also ice can melt or sublime if in, in low atmospheres. So... Um, yeah, it will constrain like your colony. It would have to like be in the shadows and, and stuff like that. So there's some disadvantages to that approach. And um, <clears throat> the next option is is making like a martial version of cement or concrete. Um, so basically, you can mine certain minerals like carbonate <coughs> minerals from certain places on Mars, um, and basically make like a yeah martial version of cement. And you can add uh, regolith and then add water for a hydration-based reaction to make um, concrete. Uh, the advantage is it's very strong, we can make a lot of it, it's tried and tested because it's what we do a lot of on Earth, and uh, it's 3D pr you can 3D print concrete. Uh, the disadvantages are though it needs a lot of uh, mining and processing, and that means you're going to have to take mining and processing equipment like yeah, big diggers or, or transportation equipment, it's going to add a lot of launch mass and, and, and things that can break down, so you need redundancy for things like that. Uh, that'll add a lot of cost, use a lot of energy, um, yeah, so making cement uses huge amounts of energy 
which is not good for, for regions I mentioned before, and it uses water, so there's quite a lot of disadvantages to that approach. Um, another option is to use sulfur, so you can use sulfur as a binder, so basically some types of regolith are particularly sulfur rich, you can heat it, extract sulfur, and use that as a binder to make like a sulfur based concrete. This is quite strong, you can also make a lot of it, and you don't need water which is a, a key advantage, uh, but the disadvantages are it again uses a lot of energy and sulfur sublimes, um, so yeah under low pressures and elevated temperatures it will go and that will not be good. Um, so the material challenge has, still hasn't been solved, and um, this is basically where my work uh, comes into it. So basically we thought, um, and it's based on some other people's work as well, but we, th we, we went down the route of thinking can we use biopolymers as binders? So basically in the past we used to use all sorts of um, biopolymers like proteins and carbohydrates as, as glues and binders, so we used to use blood to make uh, plastic-like materials, and we sent horses to the glue factory because we boiled down their skin and their, their hooves and their their, their sinew and their bones to make collagen based binders and we used to use cheese or casein based binders uh, even up until World War II we used to glue together wooden parts of airplanes um, with um, cheese based binders so we thought um, can we get a protein adhesive or a binder um, mix it with regolith uh, compact it and then dry it and get like a, a concrete like material um, and initially we were thinking of, of doing this through biotechnology so getting like an uh, base, get like an engineered uh, microorganism um, kind of make it express a specific protein like you can make it express synthetic spider silk which could be used as a glue and then do some formulation optimization to make like a protein based adhesive um, so there is a quite a strong case for using biotechnology um, for off-world habitation um, so basically Biotechnology could be something that could quite could uh, integrate several systems and simplify mission architecture. Um, and Mars has all the necessary ingredients for life. That's one of the reasons we want to go there because we think it might have had a might have had life in the past because of all the ingredients. Um, ooh, so it can definitely support you know, life and, and biotechnology. And any kind of crude habitat is going to obviously have to have the capability to support, support life anyway. So we can support other organisms like microorganisms. Um, so one of the um, interesting kind of notions is to bring these algae photobioreactors. So algae uh, basically can live off water, carbon dioxide, it can fix nitrogen, and uh, it, can eat, it needs trace elements and it grows on sunlight. Um, and essentially, yeah, these are all things you can obtain on the Martian surface, and they can produce food, so algae is edible. Um, yeah, they take in carbon dioxide, produce oxygen, which is obviously going to be important um, to produce on, on, on the moon or Mars. Um, algae are also used as third generation biofuels, so like 50% of algae mass is, is oils and lipids, um, and we need to re, basically refuel the Martian ascent vehicle. You, when, you want, when you land on Mars, you don't want to land with a full uh, petrol tank, essentially, a full fuel tank. You want it to be empty and then refuel it on Mars, ideally. Otherwise, it's going to add loads of launch mass if you have to land it full and then take off. Uh, so algae is, is pretty well suited for this. So they can make um, biofuels, essentially, which are quite stable. So they're not going to... It's not going to be a lot of effort to, to store them for when you need them. You can also engineer algae and other microorganisms to produce all sorts of useful things just through biotechnology, biomanufacturing. Uh, so, for example, you can use them to manufacture certain pharmaceuticals. Uh, this is a big advantage because um, if you send like a load of people to Mars and they're not going to come back for 500 days, people might get ill, they might get illnesses, and they might need certain medicines. Um, you either have to take all these potential medicines you might need, which is going to add a lot of launch mass, and they might you know, degrade over time, especially with elevated radiation. But if you have um, bioreactors... You could, if someone gets ill, you can potentially manufacture those pharmaceut pharmaceuticals in situ. You know, scientists at NASA will work hard to, to develop like, the DNA construct, which will they'll just email to the astronauts and they, they will uh, have that made and put it into the algae. So you can basically produce pharmaceuticals or specific chemicals you need on the Martian surface without having to transport it. So that's a big advantage. So we thought, can we also use algae to essentially make materials, like you know, make spider silk or something, uh, which we then use... Um, yeah, for, for construction and yeah so this inter the, the, the concept of these bioreactors they integrate several systems into one so you have food, oxygen, fuel, pharmaceuticals, materials all integrated into a single bioreactor system so then uh, you don't need a separate oxygen generation device separate food uh, production system separate fuel manufacturing facility it can all be done with this one integrated system 
which is uh, advantages, as I mentioned previously. Um, but then, so, yes, yeah, so then we were thinking about this and we did this, um, this experiment, but what we did was we essentially found, just through a control experiment, so we tested spider silk as, like a, as an adhesive in this case, um, and it was quite strong. But then a control experiment where we used, uh, it's called bovine serum albumin, and it's very commonly used in any type of like bio biochemistry. It's like the, the cheapest protein. We found that was actually stronger as a glue than, um, yeah, our actual experiment, the spider silk. So we thought, do we even need to use biotechnology? Can we just kind of use these natural proteins instead? But obviously it's not feasible to take cows into space. It's gonna be like a nightmare. Um, to take the to get cows into space and then use this this, this protein you can get from their blood uh, as a binder, but humans are going to be there uh, by definition on any crude mission. So we thought, can we use the human equivalent of this protein as a binder if it works so well? And yeah, the interesting thing is we used to use blood back in the olden days before we started using oil for everything. Blood from um, slaughterhouses was was combined with with sawdust to make these bioplastics, and it's actually quite sticky blood when, when it forms scabs it's, it, you can stick things together with it essentially so we thought can we use this human protein as a binder and that's exactly what we did so this protein we actually produce a lot of it per day we make 12 to 25 grams of it per day and um, it's present in blood plasma not your actual blood proteins so basically you can um, take it out of, of your body uh, of your and then put the blood cells back into your body so it's not as strenuous as actually giving blood um, and it's present in blood at a concentration of 40 grams per litre, which is, which is very high, especially when you compare it to other biotechnology options where you, you only get like a few grams per litre at best. Um, and on Earth, you can give 1.2 litres of plasma twice a week, so you can actually give quite a lot of it. So you end up with quite a lot of this. And yeah, so this is kind of a scheme just from the paper. It's very simple. Basically, you get a few grams of this human serum album and this protein from your blood plasma, add some water, gently mix it, you get a solution. You just infuse it, resin infusion, uh, with some regolith and then you dry it 65 degrees celsius so not mega temperatures and then you end up with these biocomposite materials um, and very interestingly we found adding urea which is the main component in, in, in human urine could make them up to three times stronger um, and the compressive strengths ultimately were up to 40 megapascals which is about twice as strong as bricks so you can actually make these really strong materials out of human blood and urine which we're going to have anyway um, on, on any kind of crude mission by definition. So yeah, it has quite a few advantages. It's very strong. Uh, there's no additional binder fabrication equipment. So you don't have to bring that whole extra technology like I don't know, mining equipment or other kind of like big piece of equipment to make a binder. You just need to sustain humans, which we'll do anyway. Uh, and it's 3D printable, which was pretty cool. Uh, the disadvantages though, uh, limited production capacity, so it's limited by the number of crew. And yeah, a very big disadvantage is it could potentially be detrimental to the health of the crew. Uh, which is kind of like the main kind of um, thing that NASA and, and space, um, yeah, it's going to be very important to keep your crew healthy, essentially. Um, but yeah, so this is just kind of a scheme showing essentially how it works. So Martian environment, you can get nitrogen, water, carbon dioxide, grow food, produce oxygen. These would sustain the humans, and then you can tap off the human serum albumin and the urea, mix it with regolith, and then that's all you need to make these, these this construction material. So integrate some systems, but kind of in a weird way. Um, and this was just some data basically showing the mechanism. Uh, so this protein is, is very tightly coiled up with a lot of these, these things called alpha helixes. And basically we investigated the mechanism and found when the glue is gluing, these alpha helixes unfold, decrease, and the proportion of beta sheets and, and disordered protein increases. Um, so basically, yeah, we, we, work, we, we have some good ideas as to why um, this protein is sticky. Um, so then we thought, well, are there any other biopolymers we could use that have fewer disadvantages? So as I mentioned before, um, we used to use horses or other animals as glue, and it wasn't their blood was, was the main one. We used to um, boil their skin down and their hooves and their uh, collagen um, and turn that into a glue. And humans, we have a lot of skin ourselves. In fact, the, your skin is like your heaviest organ in your body. Uh, heavier than your liver so we thought can we use human skin to make like a, a glue or a binder to produce these materials um, but before anyone calls the police on me uh, I'm not suggesting we like peel the skin off astronauts that would obviously be barbaric but we actually shed skin all the time as humans we shed like between 0.9 and 2 grams of it a day and on earth it just comes off as dust it just you know it gets hoovered up it doesn't matter um, 
if you're in an enclosed habitat, uh, like on a, a Martian habitat or a lunar habitat, that dust has to go somewhere. So what would happen is it would build up in the air filtration systems, and you basically have a free source of, of glue, because that's a lot of collagen in that dust building up, and you, you want to use it for something. You don't want to just throw it out. Uh, you could turn it into jelly. Uh, jellies are made of collagen, but then you'd eat it, and that's kind of gross. So we thought, well, can we make it into like a glue and make a biocomposite? Um, so we're working on this. It's looking quite promising, but yeah, one big disadvantage is we actually don't make enough of it. So two grams a day is actually quite good compared to like having a bioreactor, but it's not enough because you need meat, you need huge amounts of um, construction materials. So then we thought, could we use rabbits maybe? Because rabbits um, they have much higher surface area to volume ratio. Um, they can eat cellulosic biomass. If you're growing like potatoes or something, they can eat kind of like this, the waste that we can't eat, so you can sustain them, and they turn that into compost, which you can reuse. Uh, and they're relatively docile. They're not going to cause many problems. And they're very fluffy, so that will provide a psychological benefit to the troop, with the troop, which is also very important. So that's something we're working on. And they make really good glue. So rabbit skin glue is, is one of the best collagen-based glues out there. Um, and then we also thought, so I mentioned before, you, we also used to use cheese-based glues to stick things like wood together, even up until World War II, so not even that long ago. Before we started, before the petrochemicals industry took off, we used to do all these biopolymers, so many things. Uh, so we thought, <clears throat> you know, there's loads of kind of stories about the, the moon being made of cheese, the cow jumped over the moon, uh, the Wallace and Gromit cheese thing, cheese moon thing. So we thought, wouldn't it be fun if we could uh, make a biocomposite out of moon dust and cheese uh, and that's what we did um, so this one here uh, you can come around and have a look at it later so hopefully you can see that yeah so this one uses um yeah collagen from milk and simulated moon dust and it holds it together so you can actually make a uh, you can build on the moon with cheese which i think is like quite uh, ironic and, and funny and um, but yeah we, we want to emphasize we definitely use uh, like cows for this one uh, for that connotation uh, and then another one, crazy one we thought of was like snotcrete so basically we always produce mucus you sneeze a lot uh, and that's very sticky so that could potentially be used as a binder and um, so yeah that's one of the grosser ones but one of the big problems is that um, pre-deployed habitats will be nece a necessity so basically, you can't just send humans to Mars and then kind of slowly harvest their, their snot or their blood to build a habitat because they'd have died of uh, acute radiation poisoning by then. So we need pre-deployed habitats. In fact, we need to basically validate all kind of mission-critical systems before we even send humans there. We need to make sure oxygen's getting produced, food's getting produced, uh, probably, um, according to NASA. I don't know if Elon Musk will, will cut some corners there. Um, so yeah, that basically kind of rules out all these kind of uh, uh, animal and human-based um, binders, sadly. So then we thought, well, are there any other non-animal um, binders we can use to make biocomposites? And it turns out in, in, in the past, historically, we used to use all sorts of things to make glues and binders. So tree saps were used as binders, but it's going to be kind of a pain growing trees. Um, grains like starch and and, and uh, like uh, gluten, uh, sorry, wheat gluten was used as a glue. In fact, the word glue and gluten have like a common origin. So the Romans and, and Greeks used to use gluten-based glues all the time. And it's still used as like wallpaper paste and stuff. And starch used to be used as glues very um, routinely. And it's still used by Aboriginal tribes. It's basically in the Middle Ages and, and these Aboriginal tribes, the way they used to stick feathers onto arrowheads is they'd get a starchy kind of root vegetable. This one's called arrowroot. Um, for that reason, they would chew it, and there's an enzyme in your spit which breaks it down and uh, gelatinizes the starch and turns it into a sticky glue. And this glue is so strong it could hold feathers onto arrows, even though you, you shoot them at, at high velocity. So um, you can actually make glues out of plant-based things. So yeah, we don't need um, to use humans anymore if we can solve this problem. So we looked at this. Uh, specifically, we looked at starch as a binder because... Uh, you get starch from potatoes, rice and wheat. It's like the main, it's like, I think 80% of the mass of a potato after water is um, starch. Um, yeah, rice and wheat are also very starch rich. We know we're going to have to feed astronauts anyway, right? If we send them to the moon and Mars, we're going to have to 
produce rice potatoes or at least like take it anyway. And um, yes, yeah, so we're probably producing starchless food anyway, or at the very least we'll have a huge amount of it uh, as like a redundancy if, if there's a disaster and we need to keep the crew alive um, for longer. Um, so that's exactly what we did. And that's what these ones are. So we call it star creep. So this is lunar star creep. And this is Martian star creep. And it's um, basically just potato starch mixed with Munus and Mars dust and a, a tiny pinch of uh, magnesium chloride salt, uh, which just makes it a bit stronger. It's not fully necessary. Um, I did experiment spitting into them just because of a historical reason to see if the enzyme in your spit could, could improve it. It didn't improve it, so they're safe to touch. There's no spit in these ones. Um, but we got really high compressive strengths with these, so 91 megapascals, and just to put that into context, ordinary concrete is usually 25 to 40 megapascals, and high strength concrete is 40 to 90, so this actually beats conventional concrete. Uh, so super strong material under compression. Um, and yeah, the advantages are it's integrated with other mission critical systems, so if you're growing starch, then you're also producing food, and we're going to have to probably produce food anyway and the plants also produce oxygen which we need to do anyway so if you can use it to make construction materials and that's great and if we're growing potatoes or, or rice or something to feed astronauts and we're depending on that we're going to have to produce it in surplus just in case there's some kind of disaster or to reduce yield or something uh, we're going to want to produce extra of it so under normal operating conditions we can essentially use these extra starch as a construction binder as it's like a binder for construction materials um, Another advantage is we don't need much of it, so it's only like 5-6% uh, starch for, for the rest being um, regolith. So you don't need much of it, so a lot of unprocessed regolith um, to the amount of bind you actually need. Uh, yeah, it's integrated with other mission critical systems, food oxygen production. Uh, simple processing, I'll explain the processing in a second. Um, doesn't use huge amounts of energy, it's like the highest energy used is like 3 minutes in a microwave. Uh, at like 30% power, conventional ordinary microwaves. So it's not like you need like um, uh, furnaces or, or anything like other technology options. Um, yeah, very high compressive strengths, and it doesn't harm the health of the crew. It only it, the only disadvantage is it competes with the crew for food. Um, but again, we're probably producing a surplus anyway, so it's not a huge disadvantage. And yeah, if you just compare it with the, the human serum albumin and the starch binder, it literally cuts out the middleman so we can just take stuff from the Martian environment to grow food, and we have starch, and then we can produce um, star creep by mixing it with regolith and a pinch of salt, which you can get from the surface as well. Um, so there, yeah, this is just kind of a schematic diagram of, of how it works. So you just mix starch powder with an inorganic aggregate, so yeah, moon dust, Mars dust, uh, mix it together, you add water, you heat it, microwave heating works well, and then it forms like a gel, so if you've ever made gravy, it's the same kind of process, so you gelatinise the starch, these starch granules swell and burst as they absorb water, and gelatinise and kind of encapsulate and kind of, um, yeah, form like a, a hybrid gel with the um, regolith particles. Then if you dry it out, you can recover all this water when you're drying it so it doesn't consume that water. You can you can put it back into your water recovery machine. Compress it and dehydrate it more, then you're left with this um, biocomposite material. So you have the super strong um, moon dust and Mars dust materials. So I do have a YouTube video um, explaining and showing how to make this at home if, if anyone wants to do it. Uh, because we're running low, low on time, I'll just let you... Um, find that yourselves um, so that's the link to the YouTube video um, you don't even need simulated Mars dust you can um, I've got another YouTube video where it shows you basically how to do it with with brown sand and and clay so something to do at home um, and lastly um, the thing we're working on now which is this material um, our algae biocomposite. So remember I mentioned we're probably going to be using algae-based bioreactors on Mars anyway. It's really <coughs> nutritious. If you've ever had spirulina, uh, it's like a superfood essentially. Uh, algae grows super fast. It's, it's more efficient than any plant uh, in putting on biomass and performing photosynthesis. So NASA's really interested anyway just for food, but it can also produce oxygen, produce biofuels, and potentially produce lots of useful things like pharmaceuticals. And what we found is you can also use it to produce materials directly. So basically, <clears throat> yeah, 50% of algae biomass is, is oils and lipids. That's why it's useful for making third generation biofuels. But 15 to 20% of its biomass is this um, biopolymer called phycocyanin. It's essentially the chlorophyll equivalent 
of this um, algae and we found that that can be used to produce com um, biocomposite materials with pretty good compressive strengths up to 65 megapascals. Uh, so essentially, yeah, we can get another thing out of this integrated system. We could potentially use this whole kind of algae photobioreactors for all sorts of things. And that means we, you know, we don't have to have lots of different separate systems. We just have one integrated system, maybe several backups, so we just in case one or two of them break down. Um, but it significantly simplifies like the, the architecture we need to, to sustain humans on the moon and Mars. Um, and yeah, producing materials from it as well is, is just kind of like the, the, the extra thing on top. And interestingly, um, yeah, we basically found it, it, it kind of had the same mechanism as blood um, and also spider silk. So spider silk, the reason it, uh, the way it kind of um, turns into a very strong fibre is it also undergoes this kind of like transition I mentioned before. And we found that the blood protein also goes and this goes, undergoes this transition, which is why blood is, is sticky. Um, and this protein as well undergoes the same transition. Um, which was kind of interesting mechanistically. Um, so lastly, and it looks like I'm bang on time, eight o'clock, um, I just want to um, show this diagram. So this kind of compares all the potential ways we can build on the Moon and Mars, all the other technology options. Uh, so on this axis, it's the amount of material you need beyond unprocessed regolith. So, um, so for example, these technologies, you need quite a lot of other stuff rather than just kind of like the raw Moon dust, the raw Mars dust. Um, and this is the compressive strength on this axis. So these aren't very good. Um, oh, and also the colour, the brown colour or yellow colour, I don't know how it's come out on that, um, is, a, is a medium energy process. Green is a low energy process. And these purple ones are high energy processes. Um, and these biocomposites all exist in quite a nice region of this plot. So not much material needed beyond unprocessed regolith very high compressive strength, but also low energy, so we don't need so many solar panels or any extra energy generation equipment. So they're looking quite good. Um, so in summary, uh, yeah, we'll need thick walls and ceilings for off-world habitats just to protect the astronauts from radiation exposure. Um, regolith biocomposites seem to be a relatively promising option compared to all the other uh, potential options. It's probably best to stick to non-human and non-animal solutions unless you want quite a high uh, altmetric score. So basically we've got like some press releases with these. So they, um, yeah, we got like quite a lot of um, news outlets and news attention. So yeah, it's, it's good for, for media attention and also like outreach with schools, talking, talking to kids about making materials with, with, with blood and snot goes down quite well. Um, but also I think the main thing, just tying back into the thing I talked about at the start is um, this, these material concepts and these technologies would help spearhead the development of, of relatively green materials on Earth, and that's exactly what I'm doing now. So I've got a startup company where we're essentially translating this, these technology concepts for green materials on Earth. So, for example, we have um, starcrete, so starch-based concrete, just applied to uh, yeah Earth. So we just use kind of crushed, recycled uh, aggregate, uh, stick that together with starch, and we can make like a bioconcrete. Uh, one weakness is it's sensitive to moisture. Which is, um, it doesn't really matter on the moon and Mars because it's never going to rain right. But on Earth, you know, you can't really use it as a concrete if it's going to get rained on and, and fall apart. And uh, so we're still working on, on developing that. Um, we've also kind of applied the concept to ceramic like materials. So here we use, uh, instead of moon dust, Mars dust, we use uh, calcium carbonate from a captured carbon source. So one of the ways you can capture carbon dioxide is you, is you get ashes from a combustion process and you combine the ashes with the flue gas, so the, the kind of. Uh, carbon dioxide rich exhaust gas from the same combustion process and um, some of that carbon dioxide will react with, with metal oxides in the ashes, uh, calcium oxide, <coughs> magnesium oxide to form carbonate minerals so you can capture some of your carbon dioxide and turn it into carbonate minerals uh, and we've basically shown you can make a ceramic like material with um, um, yeah, that captured carbon dioxide in the form of carbonate minerals and the binder we use is um, if you've ever opened a can of chickpeas and drained away the gross water uh, it's called aquafaba, but it's a vegan egg white substitute, and we use that as the binder. And the way we got to that conclusion was um, egg whites used to be used as like a gluna binder back in historical times. And in fact, it's very related to the protein in blood. Uh, when chickens make their eggs, they essentially like filter their blood um, and accumulate these albumin proteins in, in the egg white. 
and um, because egg white works well as a binder, uh, someone suggested one of my one of my friends suggested have you tried the vegan substitute for egg white, aquafaba? So we found yeah the gross water you pour away when you open kind of chickpeas can can stick together, um, calcium carbonate the, from a captured carbon source and produce a ceramic like material. Um, and ordinary ceramic tiles they have a very high carbon footprint um, because they're fired. So um, yeah, 80 to 90 percent of a of a normal tile's carbon footprint are from these firing sets. They have to go in kilns and be baked for like a thousand degrees Celsius for several hours. Uh, so these materials they aren't fired. So they they have like several kind of green credentials, and it's all come from uh, the moon dust, Mars dust, kind of like Pashit trying to develop these new technologies for moon Mars, now translating them back to Earth. So I think that's a really kind of um, neat green notion, and also the phycocyanin one. So we've also developed like a a tile from, again, calcium carbonate and this um, protein you can get from algae. And the neat thing is it, it essentially supports third generation biofuels. So third generation biofuels are from algae. Um, as I mentioned before, 50% of algae biomass is, is oils and lipids, but 15 to 20% is this protein. So we can use essentially a co-product. So it goes from being a kind of a very low value co-product to something with, with, with genuine utility uh, to make a tile substitute again so if we can kind of displace ordinary ceramic tiles with something like that then it's very green um, and yeah uh, lastly I just want to say yeah I, we have this ongoing art science collaboration so a lot of these material concepts actually aren't my own it's because we were messing around with with artists and you know, my artist friend suggested oh why don't you try rabbit skin glue and I was like what's rabbit skin glue and not someone else suggested have you tried using starch glue? And I was like, what starch glue? Um, and even the, the phycocyanin one just came about because we really liked the, the blue colour. Um, so big credit to my artist friends for that. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions and I'd like to uh, yeah, thank and acknowledge all these people. Cheers. <laughs>
particularly magnesium chloride, had a beneficial effect. Um, so we're not 100% sure why it is. It probably has something to do with um, ionic bonding. So if you have floating metal ions, uh, magnesium is, is divalent, so it is a, is a two plus uh, charge. Um, there will be um, ionic components in the, the regolith um, as well. So as well as the hydrogen bonding, which is the main mechanism we think is holding it all together, there probably is also like a degree of, of ionic bonding. So we think adding these metal ions, particularly the divalent metal ions like magnesium ions, uh, adds to the ionic bonding characteristics. But yeah, we're not 100% sure. We haven't fully unpicked that mechanism yet. How pivotal do you think these methods are actually going to be in terms of building a habitat on somewhere like um, Mars, where you're going to already need a habitat in place for the astronauts to live in while you're collecting? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, yeah, we'll need pre deployed habitats for sure. Uh, we'll probably need autonomous construction anyway. So we'll need robots to do the building. Um, yeah, like you say, we'll need the habitats built anyway. And all the mission critical systems will probably need to be validated and, and confirmed that they're running properly <coughs> before we even launch the humans. Because we can't like send humans off and we haven't like confirmed we can produce food, confirmed we can produce oxygen and track water. So I think there'll be a large amount of robotic, autonomous kind of systems going on including the construction, including the food production and oxygen generation. Um, so, yeah, I think we will be producing the food anyway before we even send the humans over. So I think it is fairly, yeah, very realistic that we will be able to do that. Um, and yet any other kind of like construction method, I suppose, would have that issue as well. It would need to, whatever construction <coughs> system we use, it will have to completely build the habitat before we send the humans probably or be very very sure that the habitat's going to be completed before the humans get there cheers Yeah, yeah, so they're simulants. So basically, when we brought rocks back from the Apollo missions, uh, we obviously analysed them and discovered that they're very similar to lots of rocks we found on Earth. And I think that's why they came up with the, the moon formation hypothesis. That's a planet smashed into Earth and a big blob of lava came off and cooled. So we can actually make simulated moon dust just by getting various types of volcanic rock from various places um, on Earth and milling it into uh, the um, particle size distribution, roughly similar to, to what we found, what we actually find on the moon. And similar story with, with Mars dust, so rovers have analysed um, Martian regolith extensively, so we have a pretty good idea of its composition, its particle size distribution. So they're all simulants. Um, yeah, NASA won't let me have any real moon dust sadly. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much for having me. Cheers. Um, massive shout out to PBS as well who helped us set up today, and to the Astro Subcommittee, and to Satna for covering the event. And yeah, we can. Um, where are we heading to?